As you know, we're uh, in a series of messages that we've entitled Once Upon a Time. And uh, I've had some great conversations in the past weeks uh, with many of you that uh, uh, kind of sing the same song that's in my heart about a series like this of being a little bit un- unsure, even a conversation I had this morning, uh, being a little bit of un- unsure of, is this series going to be worth it? Like, am I going to hear anything new? And the answer is no. If you've grown up in the church, you're not hearing anything new. But thank the Lord, his word continues to convict our hearts. Thank the Lord. His word continues to be alive to us who are in Christ Jesus. And we continue to learn what God wants of us. And today is no different. But before I start today's message, I I just want to bring us uh, up to speed. Last week, Pastor Sherry brought us a great message on the reminder of the fiery furnace. And King Nebuchadnezzar and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. And a fourth who was in the fiery furnace and he looked like the son of man. Powerful reminder that there are fires in life. Yeah? There are trials and difficulties in life. And God promises not to bring those fires upon us. God promises to be with us through the fire. Amen? And as God is with us, Jesus can change us and use those experiences to truly form us into who we are to be. And I think sometimes as Christians, we get confused. We, well, we say things like, why would God cause something like this, right? Maybe a, a fiery furnace example of our, of our life. We have that kind of a response in time. Uh, often in the moment of when we're facing whatever tribulation it is, and we all the time uh, say those kinds of phrases. Why would God uh, cause this to happen? And I want us to be reminded this morning that it's not God who causes the tribulation like the fiery furnace. Now, as we're going to look this morning, God may test us in our moments. God may uh, allow us to be tested. God may actually call us to be faithful through whatever test we may be facing. This morning's story ah, is a tough one for me as a dad. This morning, we're going to look at Abraham and Isaac And I want you to revert back. If you grew up in the church like me, if you grew up going to camps and you grew up being a part of children's church, there was a song that taught us about Father Abraham and his many sons. Do you remember that song? Do you remember how uh, logical it was to sing a ridiculous song about Father Abraham having many sons and many sons had Father Abraham and I am one of them and so... Let's just praise the Lord, right? Remember the song? And then if you were like me, you grew up singing the song and you would add a body part to the song. (laughs) This is how ridiculous. Uh, You're laughing. If you have no idea, welcome to the church. We're weird. (laughs) We would sing those phrases. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them and so you. uh, So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm. And and then we would just do this. I don't know why. Please don't be recording this. And we would stand there in children's church and we would just sing the song again, the same phrase. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I'm one of them, so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Left arm, right arm, left arm. (laughs) And then we were robots. And then it was like a glorified hokey pokey. We couldn't sing the hokey pokey in children's church for some reason, so we came up with our own version. And the song just continued that same way we do right arm, left arm, right leg, left leg. We would even turn around, and then my favorite part was turn around, sit down. And the song was over. I'm convinced that every children's church, every children's camp song that had motions to it was designed by someone who couldn't stand kids. (laughs) And their desire was to wear the kids down to a point where they would finally listen to a Bible story. So I want you all to stand. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I want you just to listen listen to uh, the message this morning. I really don't think it's a stretch. To think that all kids' church songs with motions were designed to wear us down. And it worked. 
But the song uh, gave us a bird's eye view as kids of Father Abraham, and that's what we called him. But I don't think the song did very much justice for uh, the pivotal character of Scripture that Abraham is. We are first introduced to him as Abram before his name is changed by God himself. And so Abram comes to us and we get this picture of this man of faith that truly followed God in a way that I think we are to emulate. I, I, I think that's why we have Abraham in Scripture for us today. I, I, if you get nothing else this morning... It's that Abraham, as a man of faith, though he did some things wrong in his life, we're going to cover it a little bit. Abraham, the, the reason we even talk about Abraham today is because he was a man who trusted God. I want to be a man of God who trusts my God. I want us to be a church who trusts God. I, I want to lead a family who fully trusts in our God. In Genesis chapter 12, God calls Abram to leave his country, leave his family, leave his extended family, leave the comforts of everything he knows to take his immediate family and to leave and go to a place that God would give him directions to go. Hello. Little bonkers. Here's the promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 through 3. Here's what the Lord says to Abram. Leave your native country, leave your hometown, your relatives, leave your father's family and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you, Abraham, into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you and they will sing ridiculous songs with your name. <laughs> Not a very small promise to this otherwise average Joe. God promises this man in history that he would bless all other people through his family. Not a small promise considering too that Abraham at this time, 75 years old, his wife Sarah, so far, unable to bear children. In Genesis chapter 15, Abram is still trying to figure out how possibly God might make good on his promise. And Abraham himself, a man of faith, begins to question God's ability to fulfill his promises. But God doubles down on his promise. Here's Genesis chapter 15. Here's Abraham's argument with God for this moment. In verse 3, he says, You have given me no descendants of my own, God, so one of my servants is going to be my heir. Can you hear his voice in just this moment? Can you hear him beginning to, to question? He's continuing to grow older, and he's like, God, you haven't come through yet. Is this just going to happen through some other circumstance? But here's what God says in verse 4. The Lord said to him, No, Abraham. Your servant will not be your heir. Listen to me, for you will have a son of your own who will be your heir. Then the Lord took Abraham outside and he said to him, Look up, look up into the sky and count the stars if you can. That's how many descendants you will have. And verse 6, Abraham believed the Lord and the Lord counted him righteous because of his faith. Just little introductory uh, verses of Scripture to remind us that Abraham is a man of faith. Not without his blemishes. His once upon a time gets even crazier in his own life. Genesis chapter 16, more time passes on. Still no son to be born for him. No possible way for God to make good on his promise that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars. And so his beautiful wife, literally she's beautiful in scripture, his beautiful wife has a plan of her own. It's not a good plan. <laughs> 
her idea was a hot mess to say the least. Sarah had a servant, Hagar. Maybe Hagar could bear children for her husband. And so she thinks to herself, and Abraham takes her up on the offer, how about I give my servant to my wife? I think we saw that episode on Jerry Springer, remember? What a mess. Sure enough, this servant, Hagar, bears Abraham a son, Ishmael. This is not God's original plan. Thirteen years pass. Abraham is now 99. Sarah is at least 90. And even in their mess, God reminds Abraham of his promise that a son would be born to his wife, Sarah, and that God would establish his promise with him. And you know what? God keeps his promises. Sure enough, Sarah gives birth to Isaac. And what do you know? The dysfunctional mess continues in this broken family. Jealousy leads Abraham to send Hagar and her son Ishmael off into the wilderness with a little food and water to keep them comfortable. And now we find ourselves here in Genesis chapter 22 for the narrative of this morning's passage. Genesis 22, verses 1 through 19, says this. Some time later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called, yes, here I am. Take your only son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. The next morning, Abraham got up early, he saddled his donkey, and took two of his servants with him, along with his son Isaac, and then he chopped wood for a fire for a, a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them walked, as the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and he said, Dad? Yes, my son. We have the fire and the wood, the boy said. But where's the sheep for the burnt offering? God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. And Abraham answered, and they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son... Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, here I am, Abraham replied. Don't lay a hand on the boy. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. And then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham named the place Yahweh Yireh, Jehovah Jireh, which means the Lord will provide. And to this day, people still use that name as a proverb. On the mountain, the Lord of the Lord, it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says. Because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies. 
And through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, all because you have obeyed. Then they returned to the servants and traveled back to Beersheba, where Abraham continued to live. Pray with me. Lord God, would you please add your blessing to this word, your word. We thank you for the impact of this life of faith lived by Abraham, for this example for us here today to seek you, your will, and to know you are guiding our every step. Would you bless this word as we have heard it? Would you allow it to ring true in our lives as we apply it? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The purpose of reading a passage of Scripture like this, of uh, hearing again the story of Abraham and Isaac, is not enough for us to simply read and hear. It is not just for information purposes that these accounts of Scripture are recorded for us. Uh, We had a wonderful privilege on July 4th to uh, visit as a family the Museum of the Bible down in D.C. It's an incredible opportunity. I I would just dare you uh, to go and experience that yourselves if you haven't yet. It's worth your time. The purpose of the Bible is not simply to give us history lessons and to give us ideas about uh, the people and the characters and the experiences uh, of them. If we are truly following after Christ Jesus our Lord, we will apply the truths of Scripture to our lives today. And so I say it again, it's not just good enough for us to read a story about Abraham and Isaac and have information for our lives. Knowledge is not the pursuit here. Rather, I call us, as, as our pastor this morning, we call ourselves as the church of Jesus Christ into applying the truths of these narratives, this truth from God's word into our lives today. And if we do, God will move. If we are willing to not just have knowledge, but to apply it, God will change us. Do you need changed? Is he still working on you? He wants to. Are you rough around the edges? I don't think I don't think this morning if we're honest any of us can say he's done working on me. Rather as the truths of scripture are revealed to us the reality of our situations of our lives of our experiences he is still working on us. So Quickly this morning, let's apply three quick lessons from this story. This beautiful narrative of Abraham and Isaac. The first lesson from Abraham that we have this morning is a reminder that everything is God's. Nothing new with that statement, but everything is God's. On the base level, I hope I'm in good company this morning. When I admit to you, as I read the words of Scripture here in Genesis chapter 22... I I think I need to exclaim very humbly that this sacrifice that God has called Abraham to do is too much. As I read the words of Scripture, that's, that's where my gut goes. This is too big of a deal, God. You can't be serious, God. Asking the man who you promised God would be given descendants as numerous as the sand and stars. The man who you promised that his wife would truly give birth to a son in her old age. The man who you, God, promised that that son, born of Sarah, would be the son who would be the route by which the promise of numerous descendants would take place. Let's be honest. This sacrifice seems senseless. It seems too much. It seems like an impossibility. It seems like something's not right here. 
When God commands Abraham to take his beloved son Isaac up the mountain to sacrifice him as the burnt offering to the Lord, if I could put words into Abraham's mouth, if I was writing this story, if I was telling this story, if this was a story about me, my response, um, no thanks. Um, God, I think you got the wrong number. Um, God, I, you got the wrong guy. No, no, God. This can't be what you're asking. You gave him to me, so stop it. This is mine. He is mine. And maybe it's because I was dropped on my head. Maybe it's because I'm American. Maybe it's because I live in 2019. But I struggle so much with what's mine being mine. My time, my stuff, my family. And this truth from God's Word is such a powerful reminder this morning again. That every thing is God's. That's the test that God was laying before Abraham. That's the test, according to this narrative, that God was allowing Abraham to experience. Verse 3, Scripture is clear. Abraham, a man of faith, early the next morning, gets up, loads up his donkey, grabs two servants and his son, and he begins the trek towards sure death of his son. Abraham's faith, Abraham's understanding after all of his life experiences of continually taking matters into his own hands wrongfully. Abraham understands the fundamental truth that everything is God's, even God's promised blessing. What does that mean for me? I think God's saying to me in my heart as I'm continuing to chew on these words of Scripture, hey, Stephen, it's not yours. It's God's. Hey, Stephen. Hey, Hyde Wesleyan. This stuff, this time, these resources, your family, your job, your career, your plans, your ideas. It's all God's. Call it stewardship. Call it lordship. Everything is God's. Why do I hold so tight? Hey, Stephen, you're not God. Not even close. So let go. The lesson for us, everything's got what you got. What do you have? We, we got a lot of stuff, right? Garage is full. Carports full. Trunks full. Storage containers full. Basements, attics, bedrooms, closets, little boxes hidden in corners. Full stuff. Whatever it is, Please know, it's God's. As you look at your kids, as we celebrate when we dedicate a child to the Lord, we are expressing in that worshipful atmosphere, this is God's. The job you love, the job you don't, it's God's. Second lesson. God is the potter and we are the clay. In this narrative, in this story of Abraham and Isaac, this is a test of faith for Abraham. La last week, it was a, a trial by nuclear fired furnace. It was an experience that was horrifying to those who experienced it. Amen? This week... 
It's God's allowing of a test. God's call to a test of faith. A willingness to sacrifice his most prized possession, the apple of his eye, this test of faith that is making Abraham into the, the man God wants him to be. The process of trial and testing is a reminder that God is not finished working on us. Abraham in this story is an old man. He's lived life. He's written the book. People know about him. He has trusted God in numerous ways and also trusted in himself. God is still working on him. The potter and the clay is an illustration that maybe he doesn't fall on our ears unless we're a part of some maker space with a potter's wheel or we watch too many Netflix documentaries or YouTube videos. Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. The Lord speaks this way through Jeremiah. Verse 1, Jeremiah 18. The Lord gave another message to Jeremiah. He said, go down to the potter's shop and I will speak to you there. So, Jeremiah, I I did as he told me and found the potter working at his wheel. But the, the jar he was making did not turn out as he had hoped. So he crushed it back into a lump of clay again and started over. Then the Lord gave me this message, verse 6, O Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hands, so are you in my hand. You're a lump of clay. It's what you are. It's what I am. And God is making us into something we can't do on our own. Nobody can do for you. No one can do to you. Better put, God loves lumps of clay because He knows what He wants to make. You are the most valuable lump of clay ever made. And God is the perfect master craftsman. You wore the t-shirt, maybe you did, I didn't, I wasn't allowed, that said God doesn't make junk. That's the truth. He's still working on you. He wants to make a beautiful thing out of a lumpy old piece of clay. Trials by fire, tests of faith, pruning, all of these are the reality of life. And God is truly using the experiences of our life to make us into His perfect masterpiece. The third lesson. True faith is what's rewarded in this story. The faith of Abraham in this account is overwhelming. Again, verse 4, on the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance, and he says to the servants, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will travel a little further. We will worship there. We'll come right back. Abraham, his faith, tells the servants that he and the boy will return in just a moment. And the part that just gets me every time. i got to tell you this story. Yesterday, Ezra, Ezra and I were working on a project at the house, and we were oh, sweaty messes. And there's this river just across the street from us. You know about it? We both got this idea almost at the same time to jump in the river and go tubing again. And so we did. We blew up our inner tubes, and we jumped on the river, and I floated and tried to nap, and he tried to drown me. <laughs> we had a great time, and we are traveling together and I was telling him about my message today. I was practicing on him after we had made it a little altar to the Lord on the side. No, we didn't. I wasn't practicing that part of the story. We were having the conversation and I said, Ez, I'm, I'm preaching about Abraham and Isaac and Ezra, 10 years old. He just paused, looked me in the eyes and he's like, that's a tough story, Dad. Dad. 
Verse 7 of our scripture says, Isaac turns to his dad and he says, Dad, we have the fire and the wood, but where's the sheep for the burnt offering? And you know what I like to do in these moments? We have scripture before us. We have the narrative. We know what was said. We have the account, but we don't know what's in between the, the lines. I don't know what's going through Abraham's mind in this moment, but I can imagine as a dad, there's a huge lump in his throat and he's trying to have the faith that he needs in this moment. And he says again, faith filled, verse 8, God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham answers, and they both walk on together. How long did they walk? How many times did he hear something in the thicket and wonder, is that the answer? How many times did he just think that this can't be happening? And he continued on. His faith said, God will provide the sheep. Abraham's faith stood God's test in this story. And I'm overwhelmed at the visual picture that I have in my mind of Abraham. Knife held high to sacrifice his only son. His willingness to obey no matter the cost. His willingness to surrender everything. His willingness to trust that even in that last possible moment, God would truly provide this obedience, this kind of faith, not name tag faith, not I'm a faithful follower of Jesus, but in stepping out and believing God, this is what God is looking for. This is what God counts as faith. This is not lip service faith. This is not name association faith. It's not good intention faith. It's not better than average faith. It's not better than my neighbor who has no faith. Abraham is a man who trusted and obeyed. Abraham, like other characters we've studied, shows up in Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter. And it's said of him this way, verse 17, Hebrews chapter 11, It was by faith, by faith Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son back from the dead. What's it mean to us? Faith that leads to obedience is what God requires of us. A life, a life lived with the cadence of trust and obey. Trust and obey. Trust. Believe God for what He says He wants to do and obey Him. That's the kind of life I want to live. That's the kind of family I want to lead. That, that's the kind of church we strive to be. That's the kind of legacy I want to leave. Can I tell you? God is faithful. God is is faithful. Whatever it is, whatever trial, whatever difficulty, whatever you're facing, whatever situation, you don't know how God is going to come through. Can I just be the one to remind you, God is faithful. Can I also be willing to humble myself in a way to say, I don't know how he's going to be faithful. How many of us Go to someone and we, we, we present our, 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 our worst case scenario before them. And we hope someone's going to say, oh, yeah, God's going to do this, this, and this to fix that. I do it a lot. I don't know how he's going to do it. But he's going to do it. Can I get real with you? For the past four almost four months, our family has been on a search for a home. I told you about it a couple months ago when we had our end of year reporting and our 
celebration of service, celebration of our ministry year. And we were looking at the past and looking forward. And I told you uh, that the board was looking to get us out of our parsonage and into our own home. And we were so excited and terrified at that idea. I've never looked for a house before. Our, our family has always lived in parsonages provided to us by the churches that I've served in or we've rented a home based on uh, what the church was able to give us for a housing allowance. Looking for our own home was very exciting and very terrifying and we looked at a lot of houses. Some of you texted us ideas of houses when you saw them pop up on different websites that we were already watching and getting alerts about. Thank you. Some of you were letting us know when houses were showing up in your neighborhood or when you were going to maybe kill a neighbor and the house was going to be available. <laughs> Thanks for not going through with that so far. We looked at a house almost a month ago and uh, it was, yeah, you, some of you told us this, you, you'll know the one. People told me that about my wife and you're right. <laughs> We walked through a house and we were like, oh, I remember saying to the kids and to Jess when we got back in the house, we got back into the car to drive away. I said, I, I just hope that the Lord can make this the one. It would be so awesome. And I had the faith in the moment that God could make it the one. And uh, the next day we made an offer on the house through our wonderful realtor and we held our breath and we got a phone call not even five minutes later with this phrase. It's not a no, but it's a uh, you're crazy. <laughs> it wasn't really in those words, but that's how I interpreted it. And I knew, I, I knew what we were offering and what was being asked was just uh, impossibility. We, we said it would have to be a miracle. And days passed. And we were asked, could you do any better? And we knew we couldn't because we didn't want the bank to own it forever. Uh, and own it outright when we had to foreclose on it if we had to. And so we just kind of held tight and we said, no, we know, we know what it's worth. We know we can't afford what it's worth. So we had to bail and we just said, all right, let's keep looking. And so we kept looking. We trusted God. Jess and I literally, the day before she left for camp, we had a conversation together in prayer and we, we physically said, okay, whatever, whatever God wants to do, we have to give it to God. And we were just trusting him. And Jess was saying to me as she uh, got ready to leave for camp, she's like, so many houses are going to come on the market and you're going to want to go look at them and you're going to make some plans. And I was like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy something without your knowledge. <laughs> we have a $20 rule in our family that if we spend something more than $20, we have to ask for each other's permission. Yeah, I'm going to go buy a house. <laughs> Please trust me. Trust and obey. No. This is a different conversation. <laughs> So we had literally gotten over the one. Like, you, you know what I'm talking about? We're like, we had this house. We're like, this would be so cool. It would be so awesome. But it's just impossible. So it was gone. We're looking at other houses. And I got a phone call the day after Jess had gone to camp, Monday morning, from the owner of the one. And she said, have you found a house yet? And I'm like, oh, bless her heart. She wants to be our realtor. <laughs> And I said, no, but we're really, we're trusting the Lord. We have such a wonderful relationship with this, this lady. And I told her we're still praying, still trusting the Lord, and we, we, we've got a house that we're going to be looking at in the, in the next week. We've got an appointment set up to, to go through another house, and she's like, well, I might have found you the one. And I'm like, oh, bless her heart. And I said, and I'm sitting at my computer here in the office, and, and I said, what's the address? Is it, is it on Zillow? Like, that's my favorite app right now. And uh, she said, ah, yeah, it might, it's, a, it's a for sale by owner. Type in the address. So I typed in the address, and it was her address. I was very dense on a Monday morning. I didn't know what was going on. So we giggled. I giggled, and I was like, I see what you're doing. You're so funny. Thank you. But I, I, you know, we've told her very clearly we, we can't do any better, and we're just trusting that the Lord's going to provide. And she said, no, 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 I know. I know you are, and, and that's why I want to accept your offer. I can't tell you all the details except to say God is faithful. It's such a cool story for our family. There's a 13-year-old and a 10-year-old in our house, right now in our household, that their faith story is being written in these years, just like their mom and dad's faith story is continuing to be written. And they know that what God is doing in our family's life is nothing short of miraculous. 
So on August the 7th, we get to close on the one, the house that we are so pumped about. Yeah. It still doesn't feel real. Like, I, I remember after I had the conversation with this lady, the homeowner, I called Melissa, our realtor, and I was like, Melissa, it's Monday. I could be misunderstanding. Uh, she could have been speaking Spanish, but I think she said, I accept your offer. And I was like, we, uh, that offer was like a couple of weeks ago. I don't even know if we're serious. I don't know what to do. And we, it was marvelously wonderful. So we need your help to move, okay? <laughs> Pray for us and pray for her. She's been in this home for years and trusted the Lord. Oh, you want the address? Some of you are going to look it up online right now. 1511 Village Road. We're moving to the evangelical section of town <laughs> where Pastor Bob already lives and the Rones live and the Duns are the, the, the Putts live. It's, we're, we're gonna, it's, it's going to be awesome. We can't wait. Very exciting. Keep praying for us. God is faithful. Everything's already His. He is the master craftsman and we're the sawdust and the clay that He chooses to mold and make. And true faith, trusting and obeying is what He rewards and calls us to. So live it. Live it, mom, dad, student, grandma, grandpa, retiree, those of you on a career path, live it, believe it, know it. Will you stand with me? Let's pray. God, you're good. You're so good. You're so faithful. Thank you. Thank you for the reminders of trusting you. Thank you for Abraham and the faith that in many ways seems quite impossible. Thank you. Thank you, God, for his faith, the example that he set, the reminder that he is for us today, believing that everything is yours, that you're at work, and that we can fully trust you. God, as we go from this place today, as we go through our week ahead, I just ask that you would allow these words of Scripture, this narrative of Abraham, Sarah, and Isaac to ring true in our lives, that you would bring it back to memory again and again, and that we would live out these reminders, these lessons. I thank you for the ways you are at work in our lives the ways we can point to and testify to of your goodness and your glory. And Lord, we do point everything back to your ability. And we thank you for your faithfulness. Even amidst our difficulty, our messes, thank you, God, for being God. We give you all the praise and honor and glory that you are due each and every day. In Jesus' name I pray. And God's people said together, Amen.